Hola chicos, bienvenidos. Hola, bienvenidos a Spanish Book Profe. Today I will be reading uh, some part from An Accompany by Javier Zamora and Solito, his memoir. I hope you enjoy this reading and I hope that you read his work and become acquainted with his writing. Bueno, um, vamos a comenzar. So Javier Zamora was born in El Salvador. And he, um, and he came to this country, to the United States, when he was nine. His trip was supposed to be a two-week trip at the most. But at the end, it was actually about two months It took that long, and he was supposed to come from El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico, and then cross the border uh, in California. But at the end, that was not the reality. He ended up crossing the border in Arizona, somewhere around there. So uh, today I'm going to be reading, and I'm going to share a picture of him so you can see him. That's him, Javier Zamora, a writer. And today I'm going to start with um, his poem from his uh, collection of poetry, on a company, and it's called Second Attempt Crossing. Second Attempt Crossing for Chino. Chino is a character that is in Solito. Chino is a 19-year-old young man that came along with him from a different part of El Salvador. And he, Chino, Patricia, Carla, Patricia, the mom of Carla, uh, pretended to be a family and Javier was their youngest kid. So let's see. In the middle of that desert that didn't look like sand and sand only, in the middle of those acacias, whiptails and coyotes. Someone yelled, La Migra! And everyone ran. In that dry creek where 40 of us slept, we turned to each other and you flew from my side in the dirt. This is uh, the first time they crossed the border. They have been walking all through the night, so they're tired. They need, they're waiting for the van, but they're like, oh, we're too early. So we just, let's take a nap. And when everybody goes to take a nap, everyone, including the coyotes, the human smugglers, they also fell asleep. So when they wake up, it's daylight and they're in a ditch. And that is all through oh, uh, Solito, the memoir. Uh, they're in a ditch and they're surrounded by immigration uh, officers. So people, when they see them, they get up and they run and the immigration officers have gone so they're pointing out at them. Um, and Chele is going to run, but then like he sees them and so he comes back. So I'm going to keep reading. Black-throated sparrows and dawn hitting the tops of mesquites against the hair of legs. You sprinted back toward me. I jump on your shoulders and we run from the white trucks, then their guns. I said, Fris Chino, para por favor, stop please. So I wouldn't touch their legs that kick you. You push me under your chest and I never thank you. So when they're in, it's morning and they wake up, they're surrounded by immigration border patrol and people start running. Some of them, when they're apprehended, they're being kicked. They're being like pointed out with guns. But even though Chele, who's 19, could have run, escape maybe, he comes back for them, for Patricia, for Carla and Javiercito. And that day they're taken in. 
they're taken into custody and uh they sleep there the night i mean they're so tired that uh javier doesn't think that he's been there for a night and they just put them in a big cell young and old javier is the only child i mean from what i gathered when i was reading that he was the only child among all these young and old men in there the, the place smells they have um, a toilet in there and then he has to see grown up like grown-ups go pee and he has never seen other grown-ups pee in front of him so that's a, a different reality for him and he's embarrassed because um he does he doesn't want to pee in front of these old people these people he doesn't know but then chele is gonna say yeah, it's okay and then he kind of covers him so he can go and pee um I'm going to keep reading, and then at the end, I'm going to tell you a little bit what happened. Beautiful Chino, the only name I know to call you by. Farewell, your tattoos, your tattooed chest, excuse me. The M, the S, the 13, farewell. The phone number you gave me when you went east to Virginia. So Chino, like I mentioned, he could have maybe run like the other men, young men did, but he came back. Chino is from the same place where Patricia and Carla are from. So he just felt like compelled to help them, I think. So he came back and he and Patricia, along with other people that were not able to escape, were taken into custody they separate the women from the men and they're so tired. So uh, Javier doesn't realize that he had actually spent one night in there that he fell asleep on the cold floor. But anyway, so the next day they're calling and um, they're taking, they're going to be releasing uh, Patricia and Carla, but they take them and say, like, oh, that's my husband. That's my son. And I guess finally uh, they're taken in and then uh, then then somebody comes and calls Javier and Javier, Carla and Patricia are taken out before they're released from customs and then they're taken across the border and then they wait in there. They're like, but what about my husband? Chele is my husband. They're like, you have to wait because we have to process. And what happened is that eventually they'll meet with uh, with with. But excuse me, with Chino, I keep calling Chele, but because there's another character in there with Chino. But uh, the truth is, like, there are a lot of young men and old men, older men. So uh, it's faster for the women and the children to be processed and to be released than for the men because they're just way too many. So they have to wait. So um, so anyway, so a lot of Salvadorans who have come to this country, as well as many other countries, uh, a group. A great number of them are in uh, Washington, D.C. area. So that's why he says, um, you went east to Virginia. And that's where Patricia also goes with uh, her daughter, Carla. And I went west to San Francisco. And San Francisco, the Mission District in San Francisco, has also a great number of Salvadoreños in there, too. And you can see murals and pupuserias. And I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. You call twice a month. Then your cousin said, the gang you ran from in San Salvador, find you in Alexandria. Farewell, your brown arms. The shield of me then, the shield of me now from La Migra. It's a powerful poem. Uh, even though uh, Javiercito did not know them, they became a family on the journey, on the 3,000 mile journey to the United States. And it's also like, uh, this also reminds me in, a, in another episode the first time, like they're stopped in Mexico, when um, when the soldiers come and check on documents, and then a lady tells them, "Oh, those people are not Mexican," and then they take the the men out, Chele, Marcelo, and Chino, and they put them face down, and then like um, and then Patricia, Patricia could kept. She could have kept her mouth closed, but she said, no, no. And then she started talking to the lady, 
and she starts cursing the lady and she starts using Spanish, like Spanish word from El Salvador. And then so uh, and then the lady cries out that she's another one of them. So then she she Patricia, Carla and Javiercito are taken out of the bus and they they're lined up with the other men that are coming from El Salvador. And then then the soldiers tell the bus driver from the bus to take off. So they just leave them there. And it's a different reality. It's hard. Like they're facing down. They don't know what's going to happen. But then their um, their um, coyote pates pates uh, the soldiers gives them la mordida, which is a bribe. Gives them a mordida, and he lets them go. But then there are other Salvadorans in there from a different group that is not Don Dagos, and those are taken by the soldiers. We don't know what happened to them, but uh, it's really interesting. Because uh, what will you do in a time of desperation? Like, do you save yourself or do you speak on behalf of the other ones? And we can see in here that Patricia did that earlier in the journey. And then Chino does it later on on their journey that he doesn't abandon them. So we're going to keep reading. I'm going to read now from the last section uh, from on a company and it's called June 10th, 1999. One, first day inside a plane, I sat by the window. Like when I ride the bus, correction, when I rode buses. Below the border, I sat by the window, attention. The dogs, two dogs under a mango, trash under parked cars, drunks passed out. I sat by plain window. I sat afternoon. I crossed. Desert the third time. Was not nervous at why people at terminals. All those questions. Didn't cry. Didn't stop. Looking out the window. For Statue of Liberty. Golden Gate. Disneyland. Miami. So here's like a, when he first. When his parents come. And um, they come to pick him up. They come to pick him up. And he has to fly from uh, Tucson, Arizona to Phoenix, uh, from, to, from Arizona to, uh, to San Francisco, California. I'm going to read another poem from the same section. We were lost and didn't know which star was north that was east west we all dropped out of the van too soon to remember someone said the sun rose east we circled so much we had no no maps and the guy we paid twisted his ankle was slowing us down uh i wish you, you could see here like uh it's just, there's no commas, there's no periods. It's just a stream of consciousness. It's just memory, remembering. We couldn't leave him, why? Asked the ones who walked ahead. Whispered their hurt coyotes, faked their hurt. Circle and circle. So much they make it seem they try. But all they did was steal money. So uh, people are wondering whether their coyote, this is their second attempt, uh, if he has, he's just faking it. He just wants to take their money and not taking them across. And then I'm going to finish that, that poem. And it says, I don't know. His ankle was swollen. He was feverish. It's true. The sun heat was a reptile, but I know. If we hadn't left him, we'll still be run over toads. And then uh, I'm going to read another part of that section. It's just uh, the June 10, 1999. It's just a small collection of different poems that kind of summarize what happened to him. One, mom didn't know. Dad didn't know. Even if they'll run across fences before, they didn't see my knees crushing into cactus needles. That nine, one shoe slipped off. 
She says, Coyote said, I'll carry him to your front door myself, Patty. So Patty is his mom. Years before, she had paid Don Dago, who through Solito, we learned that he's Mexican, and he has come to El Salvador to make trips to take people across. So he, Patricia made it like in about two weeks. So she's like, okay, we can do it. But what happened is that uh, Don Dago, after he takes him to Guatemala, uh, they never heard from him. He needed, he didn't call back, so nothing. Even though he had, he had said, I'll carry him to your front door. That never happened because he never made it from Mexico to California, but he was taken from Mexico to another border, which is uh, through the desert in Arizona. She didn't know 110 degrees when like Colorado River toads, we slid under bushes. Officers yell, on your F knees. I'm not gonna say that word, but you know what I'm saying. You couldn't have known this could happen. Mom, you couldn't have. No es su culpa. No lo es. It's not your fault. It is not. So, um, I don't know, it might be a little bit of some resentment for not uh, for not being able to um, to see what happened. I'm gonna share a screen so you can see Solito right there. You can see a child. You can see the desert. He had to go through the desert. So a trip that will supposedly have last two weeks. It was almost two weeks, uh, two months old, like two months took forever. So here I'm gonna read another part of that same poem. I left grandpa in Guatemala. For eight weeks, no one heard my voice. For eight weeks, no one slept. Twice parents packed their car. I'm going to the border. Then at 1 a.m., someone called, said, you the parent of Javier, nine years old from El Salvador? Yes. So all along, on the three attempts to cross the border, Chino, Patricia, Carla, and Javier were a pretend family. But what happened is that once they get to Arizona, uh, they ask Chino for a number, and he gives the number of his relative because they need to get paid, you know, for the delivery. And then I think that's how they found out that they were actually not a family, even though, like, people, like, Javier uh, Cito says, like, Chela was a lot younger than Patricia because Chela is only 19 and Patricia is, like, 27 or so. She's in her late 20s. But anyways, but they were a pretend family. Uh, so then so then the next day, uh, they come and ask, hey, Patricia, give us your phone number. And then she gives the phone number. And then she said, but so I'm assuming you already know that we're not a real family. So he's not my kid. So then they ask for um, Javier's number. And Javier uh, just says the number by memory because he's very good at school. So he knows he has memorized the number. So that's where the 1 a.m. call. So finally, after eight weeks, the parents know where he's at. Orale, which is a Mexican way of say, good. Orale, cool. It's, it's, gone, it's gone be 1,500. So it's going to be 1,500 cash. Can you get to Tucson tomorrow? Yes. To Tucson tomorrow? Yes. Tomorrow? Yes. Orale. Near Phoenix, called this number. And then I'm going to keep reading. To write, I look for words in books. Little ants, abuelita, calls words. Right now is bonsai. That makes me think father. That makes me think father. He made the one in the black pot in the first living room I saw in this country. Correction, first furnished living room in this country. My first 
dawn, here I spent it dreaming about what furniture should be where. On that living room carpet used as coyote warehouse in some Tucson suburb. The smell of all 50 of us who waited for family to pay so we could take different vans to different states. If that ceiling's wide, bumpy surface, I imagine a movie I wanted to see. Mi vida gringa, my US life. I was ready to be gringo. I was ready to be a US citizen. I speak English on a pool, deep convertible. So um I'm going to end up today reading from Solito and then uh there's this part that I want to read because um when um they're crossing the border from Guatemala from El Salvador to Guatemala is easy because they have passports, they have US, uh, they have Salvadoran documents, but they, they don't have a way to cross the Mexican border, so they have to go by boat. And then, um, so Spanish come from Spain, but then like uh, there are a lot of regionalisms, different words that people use in different countries. So uh, when they're in Mexico, they have to learn to be Mexicans to. Uh, to see how uh, they talk and everything. So um, so one of the things that happens in there is that um, they, uh, before they cross the border, they since they're gonna go through the desert, they need to have um, jackets. And, uh, and then uh, Marcelo apparently had already been here in the US, so he knows some, um, some Mexican words. So they say, oh, Marcelo is going to be our Mexican translator. Because in Mexico, they call uh, jackets chamarras. And they're like, what? What is that? And they're like, oh, jackets, chumpas. Oh, OK, OK, OK. So that was really uh, interesting. And then since they have to pretend to be someone that they're not, uh, he calls himself usurpadora, which comes from a, a Mexican or Latino American soap opera, la usurpadora. You're taking somebody else's place. Mm -hmm. So on page 114, he says, you're Mexican cabrones. Talk like us. That coyote tells them directly, but in a nice way. Actually, don't talk. He asks quickly, with authority. Remember, things are called different here. Say, I was frescas instead of frescos. And for soda, don't say gaseosa. The men nod, annoyed. Don't Dago tell us this. Go, he tells him, flicking his wrist. He looks old, but not older than Don Dago. So, um, so, and then like, uh, so he's in full usurpadora mode, uh, and he's like, oh. So then he said, what do you want? What do you want? Un fresco, I say. Chingue su madre, which is a, a Mexican expression. No, he tries not to shout, raising his hands in the air. The three new men laugh. Carla también. I look at the ground. I thought I practiced, but I forgot. Aguas frescas. Aguas frescas. The coyote repeats. Which one? Horchata. And in here, this is interesting because uh, horchata, we have horchatas all over. And in Spain, this is, so we have horchata in Spain, horchata in Mexico, horchata in El Salvador, but they all taste different. So when they try the horchata, they're like, oh my goodness, this is like oh, just water. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting to see. So anyways, so, uh, so then they are in this usurpadora mode. And then, um, and then, like, uh, they go and get a drink later on in another spot. And what happened is that, like, uh, Javiercito doesn't know how to say uh, straw in Mexican Spanish. 
So um, I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> and it's like, uh, oh, my God, I just made this big mistake. Because, like, uh, it's hard for you to become somebody else that you're not. So it's hard for that to happen. And, like, uh, so he says, so l let's read this on page 174. He says, I open my eyes. The adults are still praying. I close my eyes and pray we cross La Linea as the linea, the border, as fast as possible, that we jump the fence and run so fast no one can catch us, especially the bad gringos. I pray my parents are waiting for me right after I jump. I want mom's arm. I pray that she hugs me, kisses me, and dad throws me in the air like I've heard he used to do every afternoon when he'll come home from his fishing boat. Javiercito's father was a fisherman in El Salvador. I hope mom isn't mad I'm spending so much time with Patricia and Carla. I pray mom doesn't mind I hold Patricia's hand in public. Coyote taps, Coyote taps my shoulder. I dust my knees. Everyone else sits on the pews. We're all done. Coyote looks, Coyote looks at us and whispers, let's go. We follow him outside. We don't talk and don't look anyone in the eyes. We're in public. We're hiding. We're Mexican. Our Mexican accents are back on our tongues. And then one something that caught my attention is on page 175. When uh, in this time, so they're going to cross the border. He, uh, the coyote says that he has called everybody because uh, they want to make sure that uh, they send their money via Western Union. And then he's like, can I talk to my parents? He said, no, 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 don't worry about it. We already talked to your parents and we're, you're good. You're good. But it's a lie because the parents don't know for about his well-being, where he's at for almost two months. So I don't know why they're lying there, but anyways. So anyway, so this is, um. so here they are, they're gonna get a drink. So he's gonna say, uh, pajilla, he, he says pajilla. Pajilla is a straw, but in, that's using El Salvador. And in other parts of the, well, the Spanish-speaking world, they call it different. But anyways, but in Mexico, they call it a uh, popote. So why you say, pa, 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 que, pa, I mess up, I'm stupid. I don't know what to do. Oh, this, the lady holds the straw up. I nod. You mean popote. Popote. She lets out a huge laugh. Patricia is next to me, stares at me and glares at the lady who cannot stop laughing. Gracias. Patricia tells the lady, yanking the straws from the lady's hand, who up close looks older than grandpa. And the lady says, pinches mojados learn to speak. Pinches is like a, a bad word, expression like F words. And mojados is wet back. Learn to speak. So by that, she means like, speak like a Mexican. The old lady tells us while Patricia pulls my shoulder away from the crowd. It's okay, camina, says Patricia. Like we say back home, camina. The old lady's still laughing. I can hear her through the crowd. I feel terrible. Are you going to be okay? Sorry, are we going to be okay? Is she going to call the cops? She knows we're Salvadoran. Guanacos, which is a nickname for people from El Salvador. Cerotes, Majes, which is a name given to friends, I think. Chambrosos, Chiflados, Cachimbones. There's a pupusa on our foreheads. And if you don't know what a pupusa is, here's an example of our pupusas. Pupusas right here. They're good. You should try them. So that's what's happening. So in Mexico, they have to pretend. They have to be in the usurpadora mode. And on page 186, it says, four more hours. 
coyote whispers. Not many people line up. We're quiet. We must speak Mexican. Those were good aguas frescas. Orale. Comprendes, Mendes? You understand? Orale, vato. We walk Mexican. Breathe Mexican. Our chest out in front, confident in our fake papers. It's almost dusk. The day is fine. Night is when we watch out. If anything happens, let me speak. Coyote remind us at the motel. He doesn't talk like that in public. So I hope that you find the time to read Solito by Javier Zamora. And before I let you go, I want to share with you his um, a, a piece from where he had an interview. And he says, the trauma of the nine-year-old boy is going to stay with me until I die. And that was something I didn't understand and that I understand much better now. Before writing this book, Solito, I wanted that boy to disappear, not to exist. But now that I've seen him, that I've talked to him, and that I remember everything, I feel better, he said. A child doesn't understand what immigration is. You don't understand how close to death you are, Samora said. Migrant children survive the horror and it's necessary to talk about that in the immigration discussion because we are survivors. Perhaps by describing things as a child, it will open their hearts more so that they accept that we are human beings. An important element on Zamora's narrative is the language. The writer strove to dwell into his mind as a child. So it's a child who's the protagonist and narrator. And I hope you read this book. I hope that you read it and become familiar with the journey that some children, women, and men have to make to find a better life. And I'm gonna read on page 96 of an accompanying an accompany that says, Gracias all of you who believed in me, who share memories, who share bread, un millón de gracias. Finalmente, abrazos, a todos los inmigrantes en todo el mundo, I believe in you. Thanks to all of you who believe in me. I read that in English, so I don't need to translate. A million thanks. And finally, hugs to all the immigrants in the world. I believe in you. I hope that you get to read Solito and become understand uh, more familiar with the plight of those who for different reasons have to flee to a different country. And in this case, to the United States. Muchas gracias. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel, Spanish with Profit. Hasta luego, ciao. Oh, before I leave, I wanted to say, solito comes from the adjective solo. And solito is the diminutive for that. He came by himself. But on the journey to the United States, he made family. People help each other. And I think that's a great way to end this by saying that um, in the walk of life, we're never alone. That there's Even though like we are alone, there are other people who will be with us, who will come for us que nos van a animar. Bueno, hasta pronto, mi gente. Thank you so much. I hope that you enjoy reading, or that you enjoy my reading. Es muy divertido leer.
even though sometimes like uh, some of the reading is there's it's hard and i'm gonna read this and then i'll let you go for sure Ocos, Guatemala, April 27, 1999. Here, like in Tecum, at night, I stare at the ceiling, waiting for something to fall on my bed. A cockroach in my mouth, a spider on my eye, a scorpion on my feet. There's no mosquito net hanging on top of my bed like back home. Grandpa isn't here to talk to me before falling asleep, to go out for walks and explore the town. And because of that, I feel alone, lonely, solo, solito, solito de verdad. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego. And subscribe to Spanish with Profit. Ciao.